I know they wanted to record this, so they wanted me to wait and, until that was ready. But I'll just say a few things. You know, some of this lecture will be a repeat uh, from the point of view of anatomy, and I think that's okay because uh, the anatomy of this region is, is fairly complex. You know, the if I was going to look at the two things that it takes to be a, a really skilled skull base surgery, one is your knowledge of anatomy, but not not your ability to look at a diagram and point out the anatomical structures. You have to you have to be able to no 3D anatomy, rotate it around in your head, and the temporal bone takes it to a whole new level because some of that anatomy is created as you drill out the temporal bone. It's not just laying there out in the open. And so you'll see today in these courses, the residents often have a little more trouble doing the temporal bone uh, drilling and dissections uh, than they have with the, say, anterior skull base. And so I guess uh, in, uh, in addition to just the knowledge of anatomy, I guess the second thing I would say is uh, Skull base surgery to me is a perfect example of this concept of lifelong learning. I mean, if I think about where I've learned the most of my skull base surgery, it's probably from these guys in these courses, just presenting uh, different procedures one after another. And you, you just you keep picking up things from other surgeons time and time again. And if you think back to the early days of neurosurgeons, neuro neurosurgeons used to do a lot of traveling. They used to go and watch other people operate. We just don't do that uh, as much anymore, at least within the United States. But I think with what Jeff Sorensen's doing and his videos and the Roten Collection, which you guys will have access to, you'll be able to go and see uh, different surgeons operate. I want to give a little recognition to Dr. Link. This is Dr. Link uh, three weeks ago accepting the presidency of the North American Skull Base Society. So he's a man of influence if you, if you want something in Skull Base. And then just finally, I want to thank John Robertson. You know, if you, John has put more effort into reg resident education than uh, anyone I know except perhaps maybe Al Roten, but uh, he's the one responsible for all these resident courses. And so uh, thank him. And I, I have another thanks to him. He took me to his private uh, fishing hole last time I was here in Arkansas, and it was so private it had this sign on the side of the river. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure what it said because I didn't read it. I just got to this part. But uh, so. <laughs> But uh, so this, this is kind of the skull base approaches that I do. And so looking at it, really, kind of everything I do is 14 approaches. And so we've talked about, uh, there are variations of each of these, but we talked about these and we uh, did these yesterday. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of talk about these four approaches. Franco went over the infratemporal fossa, and I'll just say a little bit about that. But for this morning's session, we're going to focus on the extended middle fossa. And then this afternoon, I think you'll do a mastoidectomy and a posterior transmetrosal approach and have time to drill out the labyrinth uh, as well. So we're going to just, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these four approaches uh, and focus mainly on the extended middle fossa. In terms of terminology, this is the one approach that has several different names. Uh, I think Harry Van Lovern, I think, was uh, the one who wrote a put paper that kind of coined posterior transmetrosal and anterior transmetrosal. But the name that's really stuck is extended middle fossa approach, I think. So that's how I think about it. All right, so infratemporal crany. Uh, just, just to kind of reinforce what Franco said, you know, for, for the ENT guys, the mandible is kind of in the way, and the infratemporal fossa was always kind of a hard place to get to. But for the neurosurgeon, uh, you know, we have access right here through this skull base bone. And I think it's a great way to get particularly to benign tumor, schwannomas. Remember, schwannomas, once you get into the tumor and debulk the middle, the edges start to collapse in. And so it's totally different than doing a cancer case where you have to resect the tissue. So you can have kind of small approaches to, um, to schwannomas. This is a young woman in her 30s who presented with uh, terrible trigeminal dysesthesias in the third division. This turned out to be a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. But just kind of making the concept that uh, you can get at these from above quite easily. So just a straight line incision down through the temporalis muscle, exposing the root of the zygoma. So we're looking right at this area of the skull. And I, in these cases, I don't even do a craniotomy anymore. I just kind of drill out the bone and work through this window for schwannomas. And so you can just get down, get through the roof, and just kind of showing the, 
the drilling, and this is the roof of the infratemporal fossa, and you can get into these schwannomas, debulk them with a the cavitron, peel them in, peel them in, peel them in, and sometimes, sometimes even save some of the branches of E3, maybe if you're lucky. And just showing the post hopper section. So let's just move on to middle fossa and extended middle fossa. Now, when we use the term middle fossa, most of the time people are talking about the middle fossa approach to intracanalicular acoustic neuromas. That's the, the big utility of the middle fossa. But you can also use it for small lesions of the uh, geniculate ganglion. Um, this is a cavernous hemangioma. I just have a question for the residents. What's the difference between a cavernous malformation and a cavernous hemangioma? Anybody know at the residents? Somebody? John, anyone here from your program? <laughs> John's? <laughs> What's it? Push on your uh, speaker button. Thanks, Dr. Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> so are they the same thing? I always thought they were the same thing, but I have a feeling you're going to say no. All right, you, you want a consult? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think they're... They're often confused in the literature. In fact, uh, Robert Spetzler wrote a paper about this. Uh, but they're, to me, totally different pathologies. Cavernous malformations are an intraaxial lesion that are not a tumor. They're a vascular malformation. And they often occur in association with developmental venous anomalies. I don't know if they occur anywhere outside the central nervous system. I mean, has any, any attendings ever seen a cavernous malformation outside the brain? I mean, they're a, they're a blood vessel abnormality. Cavernous hemangiomas are a vessel tumor. They're a benign tumor. And when neurosurgeons encounter them, this is the way I think of it. It's in an arc. Most of them are in the orbit. Some are in the superorbital fissure. Some are in the cavernous sinus. And the back edge is geniculate ganglion. I never saw one any other place than in that arc, which, I mean, you can have hemangiomas in the bone, but what they call cavernous hemangiomas tend to occur in orbit. Orbital guys do a lot of these. Uh, cavernous sinus, superorbital fissure, and then for some reason they can occur back here. And so, so that's a cavernous hemangioma. That's a benign tumor. Totally different than a cavernous malformation. Now, when we start talking about extended middle fossa, then we're talking about lesions a little deeper than the internal auditory canal. And this is just kind of taking you through the spectrum. So you can do schwannomas in Meckel's cave. Obviously, if it was bigger and more anterior, then I would do some kind of orbital frontal approach, peeling the dura off like you guys did yesterday. But if it's purely in Meckel's cave, this is an easy place extradural to get to by the middle fossa. You, uh, you can also use this for Petrus apex granulomas. What's the other popular approach to this these days? Yeah, endoscopic endonasal. So uh, one of the beauties of the endoscopic endonasal approach is you can, through the nose, provide nice aeration and drainage. If you're trying to treat a uh, cholesterol granuloma, the, the goal of treatment is aeration and drainage that stays open. If you do a middle fossa, you're just taking the whole thing out. It's really hard to maintain aeration and drainage, almost impossible. Uh, when I was a resident and here with John, we, you know, we were draining these infralabyrinthine, infracochlear, and they were, they were kind of small little openings. And so now I think if you can get to it through the nose, a lot of people are doing these endonasally. But the problem is the smaller ones that need treatment that are symptomatic are tucked behind the carotid artery. So the issue is you try to come from the contralateral nostril through the sphenoid sinus behind the carotid artery to drain them, but sometimes you can't. So middle fossa, extended middle fossa is a way to get there. How about bone destruction at the petroclival synchondrosis? What's that likely to be? What diagnosis? Pardon me? Uh, push on your uh, speaker there. Schwannoma? Well, uh, when you have a schwannoma in the skull base, typically there is erosion of bone with smooth bone edges around it. That's one of the CAT scan signs that this is a slow-growing, gradually expanding mass. When you have chewed up missing bone, you would think of chondrosarcoma. Yeah, so it, we tend to say if it's chewed up missing bone in the midline, more likely chordoma. If it's along the petroclival synchondrosis, more likely chondrosarcoma. Which is better? Which would you guys rather have, a chondrosarcoma or a chordoma? Why is that? What, what would you just 
say it would be the 10-year survival for chondrosarcoma versus 10-year survival for chordoma. Ninety-five versus sixty, not bad. I mean, I would probably say eighty to ninety percent chondrosarc and maybe fifty to sixty percent with chordoma. So it's one of the sarcomas that actually has a better prognosis uh, than corresponding tumors. And then petrous apex meningiomas, relatively small ones. You can also use this to get to the upper basilar, but I I do all tumors, so I don't do much vascular. But that's another use of this uh, extended middle fossa. So middle fossa approach. You know, there are a lot of acoustic surgeons who love the middle fossa approach. I'm a selective user of this approach. And the way I look at it is this. I have to pay a lot of attention to the coronal MRIs. Uh, which nerve usually gives rise to acoustic neuromas more often, superior vestibular nerve or inferior vestibular nerve? What's the answer? You want a consult? I would say more are inferior. And John? Yeah, in some papers, there's a, from the, uh, sorry, the Italian guys, 90% they thought were inferior vestibular nerve tumor. I don't and think that's right, but it's every, supposed to be more and Every time I do a suboccipital on a small tumor, I always try to say, is this inferior or superior? It seems to me like it's a high number or inferior. But I pay a lot of attention to this image right here. One, does the enhancement, and I didn't pick out great images to, to, to make this point, but does the enhancement go out underneath the transverse crest? or go out above the transverse crest. If it goes above the transverse crest and the middle fossa floor is very shallow like this, then middle fossa is really straightforward and very easy. But if the enhancement is, if the tumor is in the distal canal and the enhancement goes out under the transverse crest and the skull is much thicker, sometimes it's a long way down and I'd much rather do that by a suboccipital approach. If you looked at um, facial nerve results, at least in the short term, what's the difference in outcome that's been published between Small intracanalicular tumor, middle fossa approach versus suboccipital approach. Which one do you think has better facial nerve results? Yeah, suboccipital, the, uh, you know, to me, if you're doing intracanalicular tumors by a suboccipital approach, you should have hardly any patients wake up with a weak facial nerve. Maybe once in a while you'll have a, a bad one, uh, but, but they should just come out uh, without much facial nerve. But if you're doing middle fossa, most people have published 10% problems with severe facial weakness. Now, the papers have said by one year later, the results are the same. So most of these end up being temporary. But you can have cases where you have an inferior vestibular tumor underneath the transverse crest, facial nerve rolls right over the whole top of the IAC. And to me, the suboccipital approach is fine with, it, with bringing an endoscope. You can see all the way out to the distal part of the internal auditory canal. So the ability to see to the end of the IAC, in my mind, is not an advantage for the middle fossa because you can't really easily see to the very end of the inferior vestibular nerve by that approach. Um, so I just want to talk, say a little bit about where is the intraauditory canal, just from kind of what Jeff talked about. But this is the surgeon's view of the right middle fossa floor. And remember the old, the, the standard teaching was if you take the GSPN and you take uh, the arcuate eminence, it's actually it's this right here, and bisect them, that's where the intraauditory canal is. But in my mind, it's almost always a little more uh, posterior than that. It's not a perfect bisection. And so I, I never use that or think about that ever during a case. I never look at this angle and this angle. To me, the, the solution is make sure you have the entire area exposed. So for a middle fossa approach, usually I don't divide middle meningeal artery frame and spinosum. You only really need to get your retractor blade right to right here. And to do that, you can get the dura elevated from the superior petrosal sinus up to bramus spinosum. When we're doing an extended middle fossa, then I divide this, peel the dura up off of V3, and we'll say more about that in a minute. But if you can expose uh, all the way to here and look at all of this bone, it's really by seeing the petrous apex and knowing, okay, what's in the, what's in the petrous apex? What's the answer? I'll give you two choices. Something or nothing? Okay, air cells or bone marrow. Okay, that's it. Air cells or bone marrow. So uh, basically, if you, to me, a landmark that is crucial is this trigeminal depression. Once you know where the trigeminal depression is, all the rest is easy. Air cells, arcuate eminence, meatal plane, petrous apex, trigeminal depression. And so I use that 
to decide where to drill. How far am I from this area back? And I just found that more useful than drawing any angles or trying to figure out where's the external ear canal and uh, such things. Now, this is a drawing from Rob Jackler's book, just kind of showing uh, the typical exposure for middle phosphate case. And I'm going, to show, I'm going to show a video of a patient that I did. Uh, I've worked with five neurotologists in my life, but this was a time where I didn't have a neurotologist. So I did this case uh, by myself. And I'm just going to show the anatomy of the facial nerve, the labyrinthine segment, geniculate ganglion, and the, uh, and, uh, the tympanic segment. Now, this is a patient who had a hemangioma. This is a, this is a cavernous hemangioma, but the video I'm going to show I lost the films on. But it's just the hemangioma that was in the skull right here. So we're going to see after this hemangioma was in the bone right here, and we're going to see the GSPN, the labyrinthine segment, going into the tympanic segment, or the distal part of the facial nerve. So here's just straight line incision again. And so here we've lifted up the uh, dura, and we're looking at, uh, this is the hemangioma in the skull here. You can see the hemangioma right over the facial hiatus, stimulating with a facial nerve stimulator. And basically what I would do is stimulate, see if there are any nerve fibers, then drill, drill away bone if there was nothing to stimulate it. Now she had a recurrent, quote, Bell's palsy and had a grade 5 facial nerve function pre-op. And so still had a tiny little bit of movement uh, that had kind of progressed over several years. And so I, my thought was I'm not going to try to resect the facial nerve and graft it. I'm going to try to decompress it, see if she can get better. And uh, so here's just the GSPN coming back. Still some uh, bone I'm going to drill out over the distal part of the interauditory canal. So here we're going to find the, the dura. And we just keep irrigating, keep drilling slowly, peeling away pieces of this uh, hemangioma in the skull. Again, checking what's a, what's a nerve fiber and what's not with a nerve stimulator. Here's the dura, the distal part of the interauditory canal starting to show up. So here we see the, the facial nerve jumping around a little bit, but dura coming up to geniculate ganglion and turning and go down in, into tympanic segment. And so it's just a, a case that shows that exact uh, same anatomic structures. Now, what is the most narrow part of the facial nerve's course from the brain out? It's that uh, labyrinthine segment. The thought is that's where Bell's palsies come from inflammation or swelling that gets into the labyrinthine segment. And her patient nerve recovered to, uh, depending on how you use the uh, House Brackman grading system, a grade three or a grade four. What's, what's the difference between a grade three or a grade four patient nerve palsy? Who can tell me? You guys know what the House Brackman grading system is? So there's six grades. Grade one is perfect. Grade six is no movement. Grade two is you have to study the patient, look at them, and after a while you decide there's a tiny bit of asymmetry in their face, but that's about all you see. And grade five is, is they barely have any motion, but you can see when they try to activate the facial nerve some little fasciculations or movement. So one, two, five, and six are easy, but grade three and four are always confused in the literature. What's the difference between grade three and grade four? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of neurosurgeons use. If they close their eye, it's a grade three. If they don't, it's a grade four. But I heard Daryl Brackman himself answer this question, and that is not what he said. He said grade three is independent ability to elevate your forehead. So independent ability to elevate your frontalis muscle. And to me, that's crucial because anytime you do a nerve graft, anytime you have a complete shutdown of the facial nerve and get recovery, you get synkinesis. And with bad synkinesis, people cannot independently elevate their frontalis muscle. So he said to have a grade three, you have to have both complete eye closure and independent ability to elevate your, your frontalis muscle. So that's a lot better function than, as you'll see in talks all the time, people cut out the facial nerve, so did the nerve graft, and they recover to a grade three. To me, that should be impossible if you stick by how Brackman invented the, this grading system. But anyway, so she didn't have independent frontalis function, but she had complete eye closure. So you could call it grade three slash four, uh, whatever you want for that. Now let's move on to extended middle fossa. And this is a good way to approach petrous apex tumors. You could do this by a suboccipital approach. But the middle fossa is largely extradural, and um, so not a bad way to go. Now, 
there are several different skin incisions for this. I just use a straight line, but a bunch of people make a question mark incision. The beauty of the question mark incision, you can kind of get the temporalis muscle more forward. So you have a little more room to push it forward. And if you make a straight line, sometimes at the anterior aspect, the temporalis muscle is kind of bunching up and it gets in your way to kind of get and see the foramen valley. Or you could do an upside down U-shaped incision, but I don't know many people who use that. Now you want to turn a bone flap that's based on the middle fossa floor. And you can think of it either way. It's one third in front of the root of the zygoma and two thirds behind, or two thirds in front of the external ear canal and one third behind, whichever you tend to pick. So just kind of showing where you draw this, if the root of zygoma comes into the skull right here, you make about one third of your bone flap in front and two thirds behind. Here's the ear canal and you can make about two thirds in front. And I just, uh, one thing you don't want to do with the middle fossa is tear the dura. Okay, this is an extradural case. The case is kind of depressing if you turn the bone flap and you uh, tear the dura over the temporal lobe right at the beginning. So what I do is I just start out with a, with a match head and just drill down through the bone here until I see the dura and then strip the dura up this way, make a little burrow here and turn the bone flap down. And, and to me that's a, a way that you almost always end up with perfect dura in this case. Uh, because you don't really need to, to go at intradural at all at that stage. Now, this kind of sequence I go through, identify five structures in a straight line. So posterior petrous ridge, and this is something you'll see in a lab today, a false petrous ridge. The superior petrosal sinus makes a groove in the back edge of the temporal bone. If you think the posterior aspect of the temporal bone is the first <coughs> groove made by that superior petrosal sinus, you end up shifting your thinking about where the middle fossa floor is a couple millimeters forward, and that can make it hard to find the internal auditory canal. So you want to make sure you see the true petrous ridge, arcuate eminence, meatal plane, and trigeminal depression. So kind of these five things I look for right down the line. Then start to go forward, dissect the dura forward, and find the GSPN, middle meningeal artery, foramen valley. So kind of five in a line, and then go forward. And what is the reason that you don't want to just go extradurally, front to back of your exposure, and dissect and go from lateral to medial? What would you guys say? What's that? So what would be more specific than facial nerve? You could pull the GSPN and evolve the um, GSPN with the facial genital ganglion and cause another facial nerve palsy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've never seen yet a facial nerve palsy caused by that, but that was... The, Yanking on the GSPN can, can cause a facial nerve palsy, and I think that was something that was seen in tick, tick de la Rue cases where people did this approach to go in and rub on the trigeminal nerve. For, remember, they were doing that without microscopes, with, probably without headlights, dissecting the dura up, and once in a while someone would have a facial nerve palsy. Uh, but the main thing is that if you're elevating anteriorly from lateral to medial, you can get your instrument underneath the GSPN. And then when, and you don't really want it there, you want it to be down along the skull base. So then when you go back and dissect it off the skull base, it could be injured or traumatized. So it's much easier if you just have it stay down all the time from the beginning. So if you work from back to front as it comes out of the facial, facial hiatus, it just ends up staying down against the bone rather than getting elevated up by your elevator. So I'm going to go back to this diagram again because this is kind of the, the workhorse diagram of the extended middle fossa. So remember, we've done our craniotomy laterally. We're going to start, and we're going to start posteriorly. Just because if you come down here, you could get your instrument underneath GSPN. This particular patient's facial hiatus is pretty close to the trigeminal nerve. Some of them are here, so you can easily elevate that, and then you have to try to get it off the dura, and you might injure it. So start posteriorly, and make sure you find the true petrous ridge. In this diagram, here would be the false petrous ridge, and this line would kind of continue up along the anterior edge of the superior petrosal sinus. But make sure you find the actual true petrous ridge because in these courses very often residents will dissect back, see the first edge, and that just shifts your thinking just a couple millimeters back and it can make you start drilling in the wrong place. So make sure you find the true petrous ridge, arcuate eminence, meatal plane, petrous apex, trigeminal impression. Now when you're doing a real patient, sometimes it's hard to get all the way to here without dissecting the GSPN off. It's just the dura is just hard to elevate up. So after you get to the meatal plane, then you can start working forward, working forward, working forward. Then get to the petrous apex, work forward, work forward, work forward. And then you'll start to see the GSPN. Now in some patients, 
with a freer, you can just dissect that plane. I tend to bring in a micro scissors and just as I'm elevating the dura, cut any little adhesions between the GSPN and the dura. and just tends to be a little gentler on the GSPN. Now, then you want to divide the middle meningeal artery. And the dura is still kind of tight at this point. You're still kind of having trouble lifting it up. There's CSF in there. But once you peel the dura up off of V3, so you can, sometimes you can just dissect and keep rolling the dura up. Sometimes you have to take a 15 blade and cut a little bit through the dura right here. But once you elevate the dura up off of this area, all of a sudden there's lots of room. And the retractor's not that tight. And you can see the whole Petrus apex. And uh, it's very easy to know your anatomy at that point. So that's what we want you to do. Come down this edge, then go forward, then cut this, then peel the dura up off this, just like you guys did from the front yesterday, but coming right from B3 on this side. And just showing this. Now, then we're going to start to drill. And I like to think of... Uh, drilling the Petrus apex as five anatomic structures that are not all in the same plane, but five lines of a pentagon. Posterior fossa dura, trigeminal nerve edge, internal carotid artery, cochlea, and IAC dura. Cochlea is the only one you can't see. Every other one you can see. So you can see the dura, the IAC, you can see the posterior fossa dura, trigeminal nerve, you can drill right along the carotid, and then you have to kind of estimate where the cochlea is. But once you've drilled out those five sides, that's all there is to drill. So we're going to, uh, again, do that same thing. And so here's, this is uh, in Roten's diagram, it's kind of five sides. Uh, but they've drilled out uh, probably over the dura, the IAC here. But we want you to do that today and keep drilling until you see this. What is this blue structure in the bottom? Inferior petrosal. Inferior petrosal sinus. And that's when you're ready to open the dura. And when you're ready to open the dura, you want to open it below the trigeminal nerve, above the trigeminal nerve, divide the superior petrosal sinus, and then peel the dura back. Now, uh, so this would be kind of the view you would get, and Jeff showed some of these. What is this? These two nerves. Yeah, so how often is the sixth nerve in a couple fascicles? I don't, I don't know a percentage of that, but it definitely happens. I've probably seen that five or six, seven times in my life where the Patient nerve is two different fascicles. Here is going around what artery? What artery is that? Ica. So sometimes the facial nerve will, I mean, the uh, sixth nerve will divide up into a couple different fascicles. And look, in this patient, they stayed as two separate fascicles. What's the name of this canal? Dorellas. Dorellas canal. And what's the name of this ligament? Hoover's. And what's it connecting? Petrus middle. Petrus apex to what? Virus. Pardon me? Petrosphenoid ligament, so petrosphenoid ligament. What nerve is missing here? For example, what nerve is this? Three. Three or four? Three. How many say three? How many say four? All right, yeah, so fourth nerve is somehow not in this diagram. Yeah, so here we can see the fourth nerve coming in and the tentorial edge. So in, this, in your dissection today, I want you to try to find the sixth nerve. And so the question is, where do you look for it? And at surgery, of course, you have a pathology there. You have a tumor there. Where do you find the sixth nerve? And kind of how I always find the sixth nerve is if you lift up on the trigeminal nerve right here, you can very often see the sixth nerve coming up right underneath it. And if you have a, if you have a case where you're um, trying to find the sixth nerve in the cavernous sinus, you can push down on the facial nerve right here and find it. So lift up here or push down here, and you'll find the sixth nerve. Those are kind of two tricks I use. What is this nerve right here? Porsche minor. minor. So what does it, what function does it have? Motor function, Motor function of trigeminal nerve. Where's it going out? Which foramen? Ovale. Ovale. Yeah, foramen ovale. So this nerve is motor of five. I don't think there's any, there's no cell body in the ganglion. It's traveling right on past and right on out motor division of trigeminal nerve. And uh, just kind of showing the, the final drill out, which we want you to get to today. Um, this nerve right here, GSPN, what nerve is it joining up with? Vidian. Well, it becomes the Vidian nerve, but it joins up with another nerve. Deep petrosal nerve. So deep petrosal nerve, sometimes you'll see them in your specimen today. There'll be little nerves along the carotid, along the lateral carotid, joins together with a GSPN to form the Vidian, uh, Vidian nerve. And what is this right here? 
Pardon me? I'm just seeing if you paid attention to Jeff's left lecture. What is this? Tensor tympani, yeah. So this is muscle fiber. So when you cut the uh, frame of spinosum and go behind it, there are three <laughs> parallel structures. You station two with tensor tympani, the carotid, and GSPN. And they all run the same direction. This is almost always covered with bone, and very often this is not. And uh, so this is a dural opening. I talked about that. You open it uh, above the superior petrosal sinus, below the superior petrosal sinus, and then divide them. And watch out for the fourth. So I'm just going to show a video of this, this tumor with this same approach, all the stuff that we showed. Scalp incision, again, root of the zygoma. Yeah, so here's bone flaps coming off. Dura, no incision. Starting to dissect the dura. Again, I'm going to kind of drill down the bone flush so we're nice and flush with the floor. Peel the dura up, looking posteriorly for the posterior petrous ridge. We want to try to be totally sure we are not uh, faked out by where this posterior petrous ridge is. And usually you get some venous bleeding here because as you elevate, you get a little opening in the superior petrosal sinus or something. So here I've got my freer over that posterior petrous ridge. Now here's the arcuate eminence. We're going deeper. We see meatal plane. And we're just going to keep trying to work in this direction as far as we can before we start to come forward. So here, this is using a freer and starting to peel the dura up off GSPN. And you just want to be careful about this because if you, you can stretch on that GSPN. I've never seen someone get a facial palsy from that, but it could happen. Here's putting flow seal in. You know, this is a quote of Dr. Golfinos. Surgifoam and flow seal are God's gift to the middle fossa. Because before they existed, we would put gel foam and surgicel and get bogged down waiting for the venous bleeding to stop. But now with uh, just squirting that material in, you can just keep on going. So now I'm taking micro scissors and dividing these little, little kind of dural connections to the GSPN and just peeling the dura up, working my way forward. And a lot of times in patients, you have more left down than just the GSPN. You have little strands of dura, some little veins, and the GSPN. That's fine. You can leave all that stuff down. Working your way forward, here's the frame and spinosum, I mean frame and spinosum right here, middle meningeal artery, just dividing that. And then next I'll go and peel the dura up, I don't have it on this video, but peel this dura up off of uh, the trigeminal nerve. And that's when all of a sudden the dura is relaxed once you do that. Uh, then all of a sudden it's not tight anymore. Up until that point, you really need a specialized retractor system like a fish middle fossa retractor or Golfinos use the Sturker retractor. Uh, but once you've got the dura up off the trigeminal nerve, then any, any retractor would work, Greenberg or Buddy Halo or any type of retractor. And uh, I'm just going to speed this up a little bit. So here's this drilling off the petrous apex, opening the dura. This is above the superior petrosal sinus. So now we're looking at the tentorium. And uh, I'm going to cut through the superior petrosal sinus and then start debulking this uh, meningioma. Let me just peel this. I want to just speed this up a little bit. Can't get this guy to go, I guess I'll, I guess I'll just start it. But you'll start to see the trigeminal nerve coming in. In any case, I'll stop there because I just wanted to get you to see the uh, approach. Now, how about a case like this? Could you do this by the middle fossa? The standard teaching is that if the meningioma extends down below the interauditory canal, that it's really impossible or hard to get out by the middle fossa. And that's because you can only elevate the temporal lobe so far, the cochlea is in your way, the IAC is in your way, and you just can't seem to get this tumor up. So if you try to do a case like this, you know, it'll start off as a lot of fun. Everyone's having a great time. <laughs> but pretty soon, something like this is going to happen. All right, now, we're just going to end in translab approach. And now, uh, you know, translab is, a, is, a, is just a great approach to get to acoustic neuromas in people who you're not trying to save hearing. And I just show these two cases because these are cases where a tumor was actually out in the vestibule. So this is schwannoma in the vestibule beyond the internal auditory canal, and here is an IAC tumor with a little nodule of tumor also out in the vestibule. And so there's no way you're going to save hearing in these patients if you get these tumors out. So if you're going to treat them surgically, uh, 
you don't need to uh, do, do a hearing preservation operation. Both these patients had terrible dizziness, which was why we decided to operate on them. But can you do big tumors translab? What do you think? I mean, it depends. The, the answer is you can, but you do a different translab for the tiny little tumors than you do for the big tumors. You can, if you're doing a, a big tumor, you can expose a centimeter or two dura behind the sigmoid sinus. You can take off all the bone uh, underneath the temporal lobe. Uh, you can get, if they don't have a big sigmoid sinus, you can get a, a lot of exposure. And I did this one translab because she was only 16 years old. Someone who's young with a tight cerebellum, sometimes translab is good uh, to go after that tumor. Now, if I'm doing an elderly patient with a big tumor and cerebellar atrophy with age, then a lot of times I just favor doing a suboccipital because it's faster. But you, the point is you can tailor your translab, big or little, depending on the size of the tumor. Yeah, and Shaker has even written a paper about doing a translab for big tumors where you cut the tent. So you do, you do it, it's not a full posterior transmetrosal. There's no super infratentorial craniotomy. You do the translab drilling, cut the tent, and elevate it, and it just gives you another centimeter or so super uh, view. So we're going to start off with a translab. In the afternoon, you guys will do a mastoidectomy, but the point is often residents start drilling here, and they just keep drilling deeper and deeper and deeper in a hole. You want to saucerize this mastoid. So you want to drill out above the IAC. Almost always the residents drill here and never make an, an opening further up. So you want to drill bone here, above here, back here, and you want to see, you want to know exactly where the middle fossa floor is. You want to see it a little bit. You want to see the sigmoid sinus and see some dura behind it. So do all of that drilling. Before we go on, I just make, want to make this point. All the air cells in the mastoid, most of them, coalesce together in what's called the mastoid antrum. And when you're doing, when you're drilling your mastoids tomorrow, I mean, uh, this afternoon, you want to coalesce all these air cells until you identify the mastoid antrum. And when you look through that with a microscope, you can see the short process of the incus. And the beauty of that is once you find the antrum and the short process of the incus, the hard white bone deep to that is the anterior end of the horizontal semicircular canal. So that is a crucial landmark. And the point is these air cells come together. This is just a casting of the air cells of the mastoid. So you're looking for this mastoid antrum as you drill out your mastoid. So this is just, these are pictures from Rob Jackler's book just showing, see how he drilled this mastoidectomy forward above the external ear canal, see where the dura is, exposed dura behind the sigmoid sinus. This is crucial so you can push your sigmoid sinus back. Then you want to look here for the mastoid antrum and see the short process of the, uh, of the incus, and that tells you exactly where this anterior edge. You can see this hard white bone through the antrum right here. And the beauty of that is once you know where the anterior end of the semicircular canal, of the lateral semicircular canal is, you know the depth of the facial nerve exactly. So drill out this area until you find that antrum, coalesce all these air cells, look in there, find the anterior edge, end of the horizontal canal, and you'll know where the facial nerve is. And then you can keep doing the rest of your drilling. And just showing drilling. And this is a case, this is a patient who had no hearing and, and was very dizzy. And it's another case I did without a neurotologist just because I didn't have one at the time. And so just taking you through a trans lab, basically I like to elevate the sternocleidomastoid muscle with its periosteum downward so that you can sew this back up at the end of the case to hold the fat in. You're going to put fat in to where the mastoid was drilled out. So you want to basically want to uh, hold that in. Here, just starting out with a bigger cutting burr, coalescing all these air cells, identifying where the sigmoid sinus is, then switching over to a diamond burr just to get all the bone off the sigmoid sinus. When you're doing this in the lab, Take, take time to take a freer and peel this dura off, just like that. If you're drilling the whole time with a cutting burr, you end up cutting your dura a lot in the lab. And a lot of you guys in your cadavers, you'll lose the dura. So stop and strip the dura off first, then drill out the rest of the bone. Uh, or use your little uh, rongeurs to bite this bone off. So here, just peeling off this dura. Now, when you drill off your labyrinth today, Drill off each of these semicircular canals uh, halfway so you can look at it for a while and memorize where the canals are going. If you just blast through them, they're gone. You'll never see them again. So here's superior canal, horizontal canal, and posterior canal. And when you're drilling these canals, work on the up 
superior side of the horizontal canal. On the inferior side is where the facial nerve is. So if you drill right on the inferior edge of the anterior part of that lateral semicircular canal, you're going to cut your facial nerve in half. Here, just opening the dura. Remember, this was just like a three millimeter tumor. Again, this is superior vestibular nerve, transverse crest, and inferior vestibular nerve. This was such a little tumor, I didn't even drill all the way through the bone to the, uh, to the interauditory canal. Still had a little lip of bone here. So peeling out this little jelly bean uh, of a tumor. Again, this was an inferior vestibular nerve tumor because we still see superior vestibular nerve, transverse crest. If I took this nerve out, then what bone would we be looking at? You guys know? Underneath this superior vestibular nerve is bone that blocks the facial nerve. That's Bill's bar. So Bill's bar is a little bar of bone that's right over top of the distal facial nerve. So here is just this inferior vestibular nerve still, and I'm just picking away. You can go and just take out all these nerves and just leave the, the facial nerve. I didn't in this case because that schwannoma had such a perfect round edge. I knew I got the whole thing out, so I just trimmed up this uh, distal part of the uh, inferior vestibular nerve and stop. Put a little piece of gel foam on. Now normally we don't do this with trans lab, but because I had bone everywhere, I just sealed it with hydroset bone cement. Just so there's no chance CSF could ever get out. And uh, put a little gel foam in the mastoid antrum, filled this up with uh, fat and uh, closed. Normally we don't use bone cement in that case, but a little bit just sealed it. So if you're doing big tumors like this, I would favor an orbital frontal approach. I still wonder about this. I like to do schwannomas by extended middle fossa, even big ones. But I don't know, in the past I did these by combined tra posterior transpetrosal approach, which you guys are going to do this afternoon. But as time goes on, because schwannomas can roll in and you can collapse them in, I tend to do smaller and smaller approaches. So just the last word I want to make is just these different pathologies. It's not just anatomic location that determines your approach. It's how easy it is to get the stuff out. Epidermoid cysts. I like the smallest approaches possible. These are, the, to me, the one approach where a tiny craniotomy assisted by an endoscope works. I don't do that for meningiomas, but for epidermoids, you can suction out that epidermoid matrix and then peel in the cyst wall capsule and use endoscopes and look around corners. So I personally use small approaches for that. Schwannomas, because they collapse in and aren't really stuck to surrounding skull base structures, they're stuck to trigeminal nerve fibers, but you can collapse them in. You don't necessarily need a big approach. But if I'm going to go after a meningioma or chordoma, then I use a bigger approach. Now, if your plan is to do a debulking and gamma knife for a meninge, then you can do a suboccipital or something small. But if you want to get the whole thing out, then I like uh, the bigger approaches. And that's it.